I'm Bill. I, I'm the permanent backup annual cryptography speaker because yeah, I'm a crypto nut. Um, right. uh, th this year we're doing a press review on the recent uh, progress in password cracking. <coughs> And the subtitle, I'm Stealing from the Security Now podcast um, by Steve Gibson, The Death of Clever. Oh, this is not the option strategy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'll, I'll give one of these usual perpetrators the uh, uh, set of links in the slide deck. So you don't have to copy down all of the URLs off the screen because they're too small to copy anyway. But uh, just to give credit where credit's uh, Dan Gooden has an article up recently on Ars Technica on passwords under assault, which is the primary source for tonight's uh, report. Uh, Ron Graham, Corey Doctorow, Steve Gibson, and a couple of guys that Bruce Schneier linked are uh, the secondary sources. Uh, those links will be made available on a link made available on the mailing list later. So we, we thought we knew what we were doing with passwords a few years back, uh, but the threat environment has changed. Um, the uh, brute force techniques are getting uh, more powerful in part because of cheap GPUs that you can slot multiple in and use it as a mini cluster. Um, um, and partially, uh, the bad guys have figured out the stupid things the users are doing. Uh, and the stupid things the hosts are doing. They're swiping whole databases full of passwords off of compromised servers. And then once they figure out what your password on Gawker was, they have a guess that you use the same or similar technique for your password on all your other sites you log into with the same email address as your user ID. So everywhere else that you use the same password, or if you use Gawker as your password on Gawker, anywhere you use your same email address, well, the name of the site's your password. You're, you're, you're done. So every time one of those uh, databases gets cracked, everybody's got to go change not only their password on that site, but their password on every other site. <coughs> that, that stupid user behavior is making life much easier for them and easier than you might think. Uh, this is a picture of one of the cracking machines. For $12,000, this guy built a one-off system uh, that he called Erebus. You notice his, uh, his nickname uses the lead spelling, the dead one. Uh, yeah, he, he, he knows about using numbers as letters. So he might be can figure out to use that in passwords. So, um, so it's got eight Radeon GPU cards in it. Um, so that uh, he can do the uh, entire key space, the entire, every possible um, eight letter password in 12 hours. That's with no intelligence. That's just with the brute force hardware. So um, I trust everyone here is following uh, XKCD from our uh, local neighbor in Cambridge, Randall. Um, absolutely great cartoon, even though the artistic skill leaves something to be desired. Um, and uh, the bad guy, uh, Mr. Black Hat, says that the real way to capture passwords is to give away free web services and collect up all your users' passwords and assume they just use the same password everywhere else. Um, <laughs> it's probably the same problem Google has. Now it's time to turn evil. What's the plan? Make boatloads of money? We already knew that! He's hilarious. 
we'll see more of him. So, in game theory, there's the concept of a single game versus an iterated game and Nash equilibrium. You may have seen a beautiful mind. Um, and, uh, well, this is an iterated game between the system administrators, the users, and the crackers. They carry knowledge forward from each iteration. Um, there have been multiple database leaks, starting with the, uh, websites that kept passwords in clear text. So they got them, they were done. They could add all of the passwords that people used to the dictionaries that they had to improve their guessing. Um, and then, when they get new dumps that are semi-competently hashed, they could use these improved lists that have real passwords in them to be much more efficient at their guessing. Use the real passwords first, then go to the dictionary. There's no point in using Artvark until you use J1968. So you uh, and then you can take your old lists and have rule-based combiners to make bigger lists on the fly if you need them. And there's this whole other specialized technique I'm not going to go into called rainbow tables, which is very nicely documented in the referenced article if you're interested in that technology uh, that helps use the really large dictionaries with unsalted, only against unsalted hashes, which are old news. So that this slide shows the history of dumps taken from penetrated websites. This is 2005 through 2010. This is 2011, and this is the dumps from 2012. And I know there's some missing from here, but Rocky was the first real big one. 32 million passwords <laughs> were liberated. Um, then Gawker was 1.3 million. Sony PlayStation was 101 million. Um, so, there's way, way too many. Uh, MilitarySingles.com was embarrassing. Bill, why, <laughs> why aren't people taking money out of bank accounts if they can crack passwords? A, they are. I'm surprised that hadn't made the news. Uh, the, the banks do their best to hush it up, but uh, yes, uh, there, there, there is banking fraud, uh, and there is much of the serious banking fraud, though, is done by targeted malware that uh, watches you log into your uh, banking web application, uh, steals the password and the credentials, uh, so they know exactly where to go, uh, what account, and they already know how much is in it, so they only go to the ones with enough money. So what about national security? Why can't these people break, it, break into, for example, the National Security Agency, or um, CIA, or any of them? Well, those places, uh, first of all, the, uh, they're going to be using better password protection than normal folks. Uh -huh. yeah. Second, their password databases aren't going to be easily downloaded uh, from an SQL-injected PHP website um, that's on the unclassified internet. So that $12,000 machine that can't do everything. That $12,000 machine needs to have uh, a, uh, a dump file to work on. Mm. It's, it's not attacking uh, a, a password protected website directly. Somebody's already attacked the server, grabbed a copy of the encrypted passwords, and pulled it down for offline cracking. Online cracking is hard because you have to take a list of guesses and you only get as many guesses as it takes for the victim website's network manager to think you're doing a denial of service attack. Yeah. They're not going to shut you down for cracking. They're going to shut you down for flooding them with traffic. If you're not flooding them with traffic, you're not going through the password list fast enough. But once you're going through the list fast enough, you're, you're hurting their network bandwidth, and they're just going to shut down your IP address. So the guys know not to do that. Well, there are people who are trying to do SSH brute forcing. If 
the Mac rattles, you've got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> You Thank may you, be Bill. right there, Bill. Thank you. Well, that was a good question. The, uh, the, this is a screenshot uh, taken from the Ars Technica article showing one of the uh, programs. Uh, I think this one's running off of the GPU cluster, but I'm not sure. Uh, running through one of the dumps. Uh, and it has. Um, uh, pretty scary percents and timestamps. Here it says running two minutes twenty four seconds, uh, and it's uh, uh, recovered fifteen million plain text passwords. And there are a couple of you know competitive programs. So the uh, the the new threat isn't somebody guesses your password. That's still out there. You got to defend against that. The new threat is somebody steals a copy of the encrypted data that the website or ISP thought, well, it's encrypted. It's and, and our uh, PHP security is real good. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, they pull that down and run one of these twelve thousand dollar boxes on it for twelve hours, and then they've got all the passwords. And who knows how long it's going to take for the website to figure out from their network logs that it's installed. Some it's places like figure it out in six hours, and some places don't figure it out until their customers start putting together that their other accounts that use the same password <coughs> um, have been hacked, and the only common website among all the victims is this one. So they don't that have can take weeks. They don't have a, a a program to monitor that. They can. If they're dumb enough to uh, let somebody in to steal it, they're dumb enough not to watch the uh, intrusion protection system if they were smart enough to install it. <laughs> the scary thing is people who seem to be competent have been stumped. Oh. Um, <coughs> Locker <coughs> were a bunch of jerks. Well, uh, the, the, you know, they, they were arrogant, but you know, eHarmony and LinkedIn and military singles um, all got whacked. Really? And, and the, the, these are, you know, serious big web properties that you'd think would know better. If they're not doing it right, you can't count on any place that you have a password doing it right. Uh, so you've got to consider the possibility that any place that you've set up a password may lose a copy of their database. And of course, it doesn't have to be outside hackers coming in through the jimmy in the back door. It could be a disgruntled employee mm -hmm. who swipes a copy of the database and hands it to a friend um, just before he quits to go to another job. Or, or even sold it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that's the new threat. It used to be the time it would take to work through a dump was ridiculous. Computers are faster, the GPUs amplify the computer speed, and they found algorithmic shortcuts by amplifying the dictionary. So it's now practical, even when it's competently done salted. There are things we can do is hosting people uh, to do better. I'll get to that. But as a user, we don't know if the hosting provider is doing it better and if everything's competent. So we need to basically treat every website that we get a password with um, as either disposable or presumed incompetent and take stronger protections. So it used to be uh, using a password like SuperThinkers with two capitals and a number was uh, really enough to stop the crackers because it's not one dictionary word. One dictionary word with letters replaced by common replacements, you know, they find that. But this is two different words glued together. They're, they're not going to get there. Um, well, and, and if you think of it as it's, uh, there, there are 62 letters or 96 uh, if you added numbers and common punctuation, then the, the, this is 13 letters chosen from a space of 96, the huge combination, um, which would be 85 bits of entropy. Well, 
Not really. It's two words. Is one of the words plural or not? Uh, 13 choices of upper lower case. And there may be six places where you could do a letter for number swap. Bill, what's a bit of entropy? A bit of entropy is the measure of actual information content uh, in a message invented at Bell Labs by Claude Shannon. So 70, 77 bits will encompass a certain amount of uh, information? Right. And Got that's it. how, if you maximally compress the information with like a Hamming compression code, yeah. that's how long it would be when you uh, shrunk it down. Thank you. Uh, the funny thing is, Hamming and Shannon were office mates, effectively working on dual problems. And it was months before talking in the cafeteria, they realized <laughs> that it was really the same problem they were working on. One was working on information theory for cryptography, and the other was working on compression for communications efficiency. Same problem. Hey, stop that. Um, Um, so the, for online guessing, for, you know, if Jerry is trying to guess your password, typing it in and going back, and, you know, most of the times the websites won't cut you off because they don't want to get into password reset, they'll just let you keep trying. Um, as fast as he's going to type, he's not going to trip the network sensors. He can keep typing, and he'll, he'll never get super thinkers unless he's seen it you know, written on your yellow pad. Yeah, but he might have a program to do it for him. Even if he has a program to do it for him, unless, unless he's running it fast enough that their network is going to detect uh -huh. it as a network attack, he's never going to get through the list. Uh -huh. So that's not the threat I'm talking about tonight. You, know, you, you need a decent password to defend against that. Um, and a, you know, something clever that you can remember, like super thinkers with a three for the E, will, is enough to protect against uh, a computer slowly guessing your password uh, and entering it into the website. The, um, but that's not good enough to keep your password safe uh, if the database gets dumped. And you've got to assume that, you know, some website you're using is going to get their database dumped next year. You're using enough websites and there are enough databases getting dumped every year as we saw on the list there. Uh, it's not one a week that we're hearing about, um, but it was two or three a month this year already. The year's not over. And each of those years was, uh, was a, a few more were done than the prior year. It, it, it's like it's double. Oh, uh, and you know, the websites have got to tighten up their act to keep people from getting in to exploit the website. To protect against other attacks, too. You know, if, if, if you can get in there and steal the database, you can also insert malware in the website. Which is, you know, equally bad for all those people that have JavaScript and Java still turned on. Oh, and if they're used to using JavaScript on your website, you know, you may be listed as an exception, so you're a good place to put the malware. So, yeah, I mean, they, they need to tighten up that. But, we have to defend ourselves against the websites losing the big file of encrypted passwords. So there's a famous uh, XKCD cartoon that discussed how, you know, doing a little replacement of letters um, and a suffix uh, was inadequate uh, entropy. And Randall suggested having a four-word phrase would have enough entropy? Well, that's better for the guessing game, but that's not good enough for the offline cracking, because that really doesn't add up uh, to any more entropy 
uh, that we were talking about and a high level uh, quality guessing machine offline is going to crack this in four hours. In any case, you can't have that long a password. And most, many sites will not accept one that long and will not accept one that doesn't have the garbage letters in it. Uh, he was recommending that they should allow just letters if they're that long. Now, a website that refuses to accept more letters may be very bad. If the website says you can only give me this much, that suggests they're storing it in the clear or storing it under a reversible encryption as opposed to a hash. And if they're storing it under reversible encryption, all you have to do is find the key in their source code when you crack their system to grab the database, and you grab the T2 and you just re reverse it. Uh, so that, you know, when they tell you you can't use more than eight letters in your password, that is a warning sign that there is something wrong in their software. If their limit is 12, it's still a warning that there's something wrong. It's just not <coughs> quite as badly broke. But it's still, that suggests that they're storing it such that they can read it back. If they can email you your password later to recover your password as opposed to help you change it, if they can tell you what your password was in an email, well, A, email's not secure, and B, that means it was recoverable by anyone with super user access on their system. That's not good. Doesn't NTLM only hash the first eight IC passwords? NTLM only hashes the first eight, and it doesn't use salt. It only uses a um, single fast hash. So that NTLM uh, fakes letting you have more letters, but the rest don't matter. Uh, but worse, if you grab its dump, if you grab a dump of its table, yeah, the, the their hashing is slightly more secure than ROT13. Uh, because uh, it's the, the technology to compare their hashes against known dictionaries, including all the passwords that have been recovered from RockU and LinkedIn, etc., uh, runs very fast. Uh, NTLM might as well just store the passwords in a readable file. It's that bad. Windows still using that for logging and matching? Uh, I think new versions do not use it, but the servers still support it because you never know when someone might uh, might might want to hook up an NT4 machine. I know, I know on the Mac, if you, enable, uh, if you enable Samba sharing on the Mac, they do an NTLM hash version of the password, which is really easy to crack. Apparently. Yes, very. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the other thing is that uh, what we're talking about here is untargeted attack. We're not targeting Jerry. We're trying to get as many passwords of as many people in the room as we can. We don't care which ones. Well, if these systems are backed by an NTLM data store, it might explain why they only accept all these characters. Um, but, you know, that would be dead, so. Uh, so that. You know, this isn't targeted, this is, you know, grab several million passwords and we're going to try to get three million uh, exploitables out of it. Uh, well, is there a, uh, any commercial companies that are, are doing this and then offering them uh, to the highest bidder? Does anyone uh, makes money by getting these passwords and saying, who wants to pay XYZ for these? I wouldn't call them commercial companies, I'd call them racketeers. Sure, <laughs> that's right, of course. Yeah, there, there, there are... Uh, so in other words, one can buy this on the open market. Yeah, just like you can buy zero-day exploits. And buy what? Zero-day exploits. So I don't know what that is. It's a, it's a security vulnerability that hasn't been discovered yet. So nobody knows about it, it hasn't been But you're saying it's available. It's oh, yeah. Available. I wonder why the uh, fundamentalists aren't using that. They can't pay them. Oh, I don't believe that. They got oil. They're being bought out by the NSA and the CIA, and all these national governments are paying for this on the black market, too. So they've got a significantly deeper pocket. So they, they've got competitors from the good guys. That's very interesting. I'm learning a lot tonight.
<laughs> well, if the NSA buys your password, I'm not, not sure if you'll call them the good guys. <laughs> well, they can have me, you know. It's, they already know you. It, it's they probably, probably do. It's probably safer in their hands than in the hands of somebody that would rifle a bank account. Um, That's right. What are they going to do with my stuff? You know, and and you know, if they want stuff, they, money. huh? If they want his stuff, they could, you know, get a warrant to get it anyway. No, I don't think they could. I don't believe they could. Now, what judge is going to give them a warrant for that? Yeah, you'd be surprised. I would be surprised. They they pick their judge carefully. Huh? When they want a warrant, they pick their judge carefully. Well, that's true too. You're right about that. You find a judge that approves uh, sex change operations for. Prisoners. Don't talk about that. That's probably not the right judge for them to go through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not really not. So the uh, now in terms of a regular, no, how, how secure are randomly generated passwords? Randomly generated passwords are going to be uh, this secure. This is the uh, speed of bulk cracking for uh, with a desktop a GPU or a cloud so that you know an eight character password you know may take ten days to crack if you throw the Amazon cloud at it but it will break so for a random password you need something bigger than eight be really safe. Well, I just got my 14 uh, characters in the hider. 14 characters? That should be good for a few more years. Yes. 13 or 14 characters if they'll let you use it with a big character set uh, will be uh, safe if it is truly random. Well, where do you get a random password? We'll get to that. Okay. So, recommendations. Mostly from Dan Gooden with a bit of Steve Gibson thrown in. Every password should be unique. You do not use the same password on two sites. Random character set, as Jeffrey said, 13 or more characters uh, with the maximum character set that the website will accept. If the website only takes nine characters and only takes certain letters and punctuation, then you have to uh, either tame your random generator or reject things until it comes up with one. But we're talking specifically about passwords here. Yeah. There's no reason not to use the same SSH key. SSH keys are different. Right. Yeah. Uh, as it, <coughs> if I ran the world, everything would be SSH keys and there wouldn't be passwords. There would only be passphrases on keys. What Steve say? He says, you don't, you don't code like, uh, like uh, uh, Hansa or uh, Arcangi. I couldn't catch it. Char he, he's talking alternate character sets. Um, I'm not going there. I don't. Well, know I don't know Chinese anyway. You don't need to know Chinese in order to type it. And I don't think you'd argue that those uh, millions of uh, crackers in China don't know any language other than English. But I think. Um, and besides, it's just a bunch of bits anyway. Yeah. So and now the uh, changing your password regularly is still a good idea, even if it's random, but somewhat less important. Real key, always log in over HTTPS or another secure connection like SSH. Uh, because if you're going unsecured over Wi-Fi, um, half the laptops in the room are running Wireshark and have already grabbed your password. Looks like you need your plug-in for your Oop! I didn't... My stupid spare... Um, power adapter needs to be tapped after it's plugged in. Thank you, Chamber. I didn't notice that either. Hey. when I turn the power on. Okay, we're back. Um, 
So obviously, if you're going to have a truly unique password for every site you go to, um, you're not going to memorize those. You're going to need a tool. Uh, recommended tools include one password, password safe, keep pass, and last pass. Uh, disk drive and security uh, wonk Steve Gibson of the Security Now podcast uh, did an analysis of some of these. He really likes LastPass. We'll get to that. Too uh, bad you didn't print that out for us. Um, to take it home with us. What, what, what we can share on the website, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, do, however, Super Gen Pass is not recommended. It has problems. Uh, preference for LastPass. It has plugins or apps to cover pretty much every browser and portable device you care to try. Uh, and uh, they, I'm pretty sure they said that I could even use it uh, with the Firefox uh, for my Nokia uh, Linux phone that is none of the above um, for phones. Um, it's a uh, freemium in that the apps uh, for the the apps for the mobile devices are uh, a subscription like a buck a month. Um, Bill, what are those numbers down on the bottom right hand side? This is a list of Security Now episodes that are um, also mentioned LastPass in addition to the episode that's the major review. So if you go to the Security Now, um, Security Now podcast is one of the few podcasts that has a full uh, TypeScript of the podcast uh, archived on the web. Um, Steve has a uh, uh, gal who plays it back slowly, backing up, backing up, backing up, and types in the whole thing as dialogue, and it's available as TXT, HTML, PDF, um, and he also does uh, down resed audio files for people with slow dial up. Um, but it's uh, primarily distributed by the Twit network, but uh, Steve does those other alternate distributions. Key thing that he looks for in security software is if it has what he calls the TNO or trust no one property. <laughs> your key should never leave your device. Same with the private public key pairs that you're going to sign tonight. Um, the private key you generate never leaves your control. Um, shouldn't go on a system that you're not the administrator of. Somebody else administers your machine, it's out of your control. Really. Um, and your data should be decryptable only with your key, not with anybody else's. A lot of the uh, Dropbox type services that offer security do not meet trust no one. Where the, in those cases, in many cases of your um, online file storage, the, um, your encrypted files uh, can be decrypted and handed over if somebody presents a warrant uh, to the website operator. Uh, and that also means a cracker or a um, staff member having a bad day uh, can fake the system and get your content. And I read a study done on Spider Oak, which claims to uh, be least, uh, they claim they, they don't have your keys. Yes, if, if you uh, Google Steve's GRC.com slash security now uh, subtree uh, and, you know, Google his archives. Uh, you can see his review of Spider Oak. Uh, so he, so th this is what he looks for: that your data is never decrypted or decryptable anywhere except under your control. If it doesn't meet that trust no one standard, he doesn't trust it. LastPass meets his trust no one criteria. Your data is stored on their server. That's how you can sync between multiple devices but all they're storing is an encrypted blob. They're not storing your key. 
Um, your yeah, one of the things that they're very strong about is that when you sign up for LastPass, they're very, very firm about if you forget your password, you're going to lose all your data. And so they provide mechanisms to recover your data. But you have to do the mechanism. Sorry, guys, traffic is real bad. That's okay. I'm still tap dancing. Okay. The. Um, okay. Hey, Brickmaster, um, say something snotty to Blake. Don't say anything snotty. Say thank him for what he's doing. You don't got to say thank you. Here. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Blake. You're welcome. Whoops, sorry. You got it, brother. No, Steve's my buddy. You don't have to thank me. All I did was. Save his life, that didn't count. Okay. I only helped him so, save his foot, that's all. So the, the thank you. The, the yeah. last pass, you can use last pass offline. Uh, it's not well look, that's scary what Jerry said. I don't you know I might I might uh, take my chance with a hack. Shut up and listen. Go ahead. Since you can use it offline, you can have a copy of the blog stored not just in the app on your phone, but on a thumb drive, on your laptop. Um, and you can, uh, when you're disconnected from the net, you can look up a password or secret notes that you've stored in your LastPass blog uh, that you might need to access offline. But also, uh, their app will let you uh, dump to a text file a list of account, password, account, password. Now, if you do create this file, you print it, fold it, stick it in the safety deposit box, and secure delete it from your system, because this is dangerous. And that is a file you never want to put on a thumb drive. Hang in for a second. One thing to understand. Thumb drives, flash drives, SSDs, secure delete programs do not work on them because they remap block numbers in real time to spread out the load on the drive so that your secure delete program that re rewrites um, the blocks of a file uh, to make sure the NSA can't read the magnetic bits later doesn't work on a flash drive. There are people looking at new secure delete techniques for flash drives, but unless you have something that guarantees it can do it on a flash drive, you know, the only thing to do with a flash drive to secure delete it is um, thermite. Is what? Thermite. thermite. Melt it. Um, because... You, you can't format it? You can, but that won't delete everything. It wouldn't? No, you there can, is no guarantee. You can write random data to it and get 70% of the way there, but there's still maybe it, blocks it has the data. Every flash drive has excess capacity beyond what's advertised. And it rearranges the blocks. And so you don't know which blocks are in use. You need hardware support and for somebody security. just announced today that a camera they pulled out of the Boston Garden Swan Boats um, <laughs> They found that the card in it was too corroded to read with a card reader, even after they cleaned it with a uh, toothbrush. So they tried opening it up, but they found it was too corroded for them to fix. So they sent it off to their favorite data recovery vendor. They said, OK, tell us what model card it was. We're going to order some spare parts. They rebuilt it. They read it. They're looking for the family. Uh, whose little girl and grandparents are in the pictures uh, from two years ago because they've got all their pictures back. They think it might be related uh, to a jewelry store, but they called the jewelry store and they said, no, nope, they didn't lose any camera because they could also see the titles of files that had been on the card but deleted before the pictures were put on it. But so that what, what goes on a flash media never fully dies. And you know, destroying the card isn't enough to keep the data recovery people from getting in there. 
So print it and put it in a safe deposit box. You can print it and put it in a safe deposit box, having stored it only on a magnetic disk that you know how to securely delete from, or uh, better yet, a RAM drive. If you could store it, you know, if you could have it redirected to a tempfs. Um, there, there's a in Linux. We have a kind of file system called tempfs, which is actually not so useful for slash temp. What it is is it's the swap device driver being made available um, as if it was a file system. Um, so either that or a RAM drive, but you know, RAM drive is even better. Um, with a RAM drive, you know, once you power cycle the computer, the bits are gone. Mostly. Did some work in that area lately. <laughs> By the way, for the magnetic disk, the way to securely delete one of those is to uh, get, is to uh, pull a huge ma pull a magnet out of a speaker and uh, put and. Uh, Actually, no. A magnet will hit one in every thousand bits. It's enough to corrupt it. Uh, but you, uh, if you use a magnetic sense microscope, you can actually see where the magnetic lines of force cross the platter. You can see all the bits that weren't flipped. Interesting. You need to flip half of the bits uh, to defeat uh, a drive recovery outfit or the NSA. Never mind. Um, which, which means, yeah, I mean, if yeah, you work back to thermite, then. <laughs> um, but if, if, if uh, alternating um, magnetic field, if you're driving the speaker, that can work better. But a, you know, full, a full degaussing coil. Yeah. But seriously, um, if you're at, ever at the point where you need to destroy your disks, you're significantly better off just destroying the disk and not worrying about it. Buying a new one later. <laughs> yeah, but you know what's hard to do? You, you take a hard drive out of a computer and start hitting it with a hammer, you might hit it 30 times before you do it much damage. And, 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 then you have have figure, and then you have to hide the fragments where the NSA won't find them. <laughs> you can melt it. You know, you melting is like, fun! Like six screws to pull off the top, and they can just take the individual platters out. It's very hard to do that. I mean, oh, I now, no, the, cor the correct thing to use with those disks. Skeet shooting. A what? Mm -hmm. Skeet shooting. <laughs> What's skeet shooting? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, if you have a shotgun and everything, that's, that, that'd be fun. You're right. Okay, <laughs> now, stop thinking, user. Now we're running the hosts. Stored passwords are a necessary evil. As, as Jabber asked earlier, um, SSH keys are much superior passwords. Because then you're in the trust no one area where. You know, it's public key, private key. The only things shared are things that should be shared. You don't have to worry about sending the password in the clear. But most websites aren't going to handle using SSH keys. Um, you know, you see me? GitHub uh, and, and a yes. few others will let you upload your SSH key to authenticate with later. But they're, they're rarities. You know, only a really geek website is going to do that. Websites that are for the public. Websites for my sister. This isn't sexism. I don't have a brother. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my mother took a programming class before I was born. I'm old. So. You're being silly. The, no worse uh, than me, though. So, the, um, but, you know, websites for the likes of my sister or my nephew. Oh uh, yeah, they're going to be password based. If we're setting up such a system, well, Jerry, I'll look at one. We're we're, we're not. We're, I don't think you know, I'm using. Ninety nine percent of our users will never. You wouldn't know what to do with it. To That's true. I don't. SSH. I'll look at it so, anyway. Passwords are what it is. So we have to mitigate this evil by doing it right. Now, the first thing is secure the rest of the website so people can't break in. But beyond that, you never store trin or transmit the password in the clear. And this also means you don't compare the password in the clear. Um, you don't encrypt the password to transmit it from your JavaScript 
and then decrypt it and fetch it from the database, decrypt it, and compare does Mike 1928 equal Mike 1928? No. You, you have to upload the secure hash uh, either over HTTPS, you know, there may be the password comes in from the form under HTTPS if you've got the login form set HTTPS only, and then it's hashed. Fetch the hash from the database, compare the hashes, or have the JavaScript hash the password in the form, transmit the hash password, fetch the hash password from the database and compare them. You always compare the hashes. JavaScript crypto is generally a bad idea unless you're... JavaScript crypto is a bad idea in its own way because it's far too easy for somebody to inject replacement crypto. Absolutely. And at that point, you should just be using HTTPS numbers. Yes. Absolutely. And the HTTPS will protect you from some of the fakes, too. Do you mind quickly explaining how salts work? Yes, I would. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, the, um, but we'll try. The next thing is, you know, so you, you use... You don't use clear, you store hashes, not encrypted or not clear passwords. Hashes are a one-way encryption, okay? Uh, that sometimes makes things shorter, some things times make things larger, but always makes things exactly the same output size. So they're good for summary keys. The key identifiers uh, and fingerprints that you're comparing tonight are both hashes of your key, reducing hashes. Password hashes tend to be increasing hashes. The nice thing about increasing hashes is they don't collide. The unfortunate thing about either a hash or an encryption of anything small is that you can tell. Now I can see you because he turned the laptop. Um, the um, other people can tell if they're equal too. So if the password column in Unix, which used to be right in the password file where everybody could see it, but since it was hashed, we just thought it was okay to leave it there. If it wasn't salted, you could scan down the list and see how many people had the same password. Anybody that had the same hash probably had the same password. Salting prevents people from saying, oh, Fred's got the same password as me because we've got the same hash. Um, salting refers to techniques in uh, gold mining fraud, where you would lay certain chemical salts on the ground to fool the chemical analysis. Um, what you do is you store in the database with the password and the hash a random number. And that random number is concatenated to the password before you start hashing. So you take the hash of salt plus password. And the salt is stored in the clear. And then you can only compare passwords among users whose passwords had the same salt. And this also multiplies the size of dictionary you need. Um, of password hash pairs in order to break it if you want to pre-calculate the hashes um, offline. But if you have a database stump, all it really is doing is increasing your, your key space and making it more difficult to see which users so with, have the same with, with a, In a modern database dump attack, you don't do um, a rainbow table uh, to pre-compute uh, the hashes and search for them if it's been salted. Uh, you just run through a prioritized dictionary of the most popular passwords. And you go to larger and larger dictionaries with whatever is left after passes through the short dictionaries. And since the short dictionary will cough out half the passwords, the work gets smaller when you go to the larger dictionaries. So you use the short dictionary on the long list and the 
long dictionary on the short list, and it averages out the median. Win. Nice. So how do shadow files help? You mentioned the password. Shadow files keep John Q public from seeing the salted hashes. So that you have to break security in order to steal the database as a dump. Before we did the shadow file, everybody who had a Unix login could create a dump and go offline. So to prevent offlining, we had to um, make it a root only thing or a privileged program thing because having universal privilege root is a bad thing. Um, As I said before, if they can mail you your old password, they're doing it wrong. So if you're setting up a system, don't do that. And don't use mother's maiden name as the recovery mechanism because, you know, once you have a dumb recovery mechanism, that's the weakest link, that's where they'll go for it. And, you know, Paris Hilton, all of her security questions are obvious from her Wikipedia page. What was the last school she attended? It's on the page. What's your dog's name? It's on the page. I can take those questions and why. That might work. I, yes, I mean, lying on your security questions is probably not a bad idea if you're required to do it. If you can remember. But <laughs> then you need to stick the lies you told in your last pass secret notes folder so that you can look them up. Because you won't remember what lie you told, probably. That's just a very good memory. If you have a very good memory, you won't forget your password, will you? You don't Bill, need password. Yeah. Bill, can Blake print out that uh, page where you said the best way to store your password? If he... The best way is LastPass. Yeah, I know, but you had that a real nice... That'll be on he, our he, website. Yeah, he can give it to me later or whatever. I'll give it to yeah, one of them to idea. put on the website, but uh, yeah, you probably could print a copy while we're doing the key exchange. That would be fine. I would like that. Thank you, Blake. Sure. You want to mention the Matt Honan thing a couple weeks ago? No. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to get into that in that rat's nest. Security questions are useless anyway because they ignore them. Oh, yeah. I mean, in, in, yeah, in, in the particular case, um, uh, Apple ignored the security questions as long as you had the last four digits of the credit card um, and some other piece of information, both of which were easily available by a cross-site scripting attack on his Amazon account. So they completely wiped out the guy's life. And he thought he was being attacked because he was a big-name journalist. And no, um, he just had a domain that uh, looked juicy for their SEO attack. His Twitter account. You know, he had, a, he had a hot Twitter account they wanted to use for spamming. Um, and they, uh, but to keep him from taking ownership of that back while they were exploiting it, they started erasing his Apple devices uh, using the remote um, shutdown. They reported his devices stolen and started wiping them on it. Um, luckily, the drive recovery people were able to recover his drive. And because he knew other big name journalists to try to get sent to them as a priority. And I think they're doing it as a publicity stunt. I mean, it even cost him any money, just a few weeks of his life. He's lucky. They should be giving it to the goat that Rico knows. It's the safest way to wipe it off the drive. That's what I was going to say. It says fit it to goats. Yeah. So, on your host, salted hashes are necessary, but they aren't sufficient either. Um, the secure hash, the secure hashes we use for commercial messaging are designed to be fast and cheap for digital signature. For passwords to be really safe against these crackers, you want a slow hash. Legitimate users will only be slowed down by a tenth of a second or half a second by slow hashing. For password hashing, slow hashing is good like slow food is good. Sorry, guys. Um, Steve always disrupts meetings. Yeah. Uh, I think he's saying he wants to go get a beer. I think Jerry wants to go get a beer, too.
this case, I, uh, I didn't hang up. You, it was well, your welcome end. back. I didn't hang up. So it was the, the uh, your end. you know, a barely perceptible delay in login is painless for your users, but a barely perceptible delay that is built into the computational complexity of the hash you're using will so dramatically slow down the crackers, even if they get a dump of your database, that your database is not going to be the one they crack for fun. Um, so we want to be using uh, the, the, the latest uh, iterative hashes, hashes that are applied 5,000 times recursively uh, to compute the result. Uh, in order for password hashing state-of-the-art today. The really depressing irony is the two most secure frameworks today are .NET and PHP. <laughs> because they are shipping proper, slow hash, built-in, integrated to store to the database properly and compare under hash properly, built into their latest framework. So the only excuse for building an insecure website in PHP 5.5 is that you're using a PHP 4 for dummies book as your guide on how to build your website, which they'll do and it'll, they'll still screw up. Um, but the hilarious thing is the security hold development framework, PHP, actually has the right stuff built into it in the new release. Hallelujah. Let's put it everywhere else too, guys. So the, these are the three options, really, that are current best practice for building your website. <coughs> but, you know, rule one, don't build your own crypto. Unless you are a literal crypto expert, which I am not. I'm your lecturer, but I shouldn't be building my own crypto. I'm not a professional. I'm a trained mathematician, but dabbler in, in, in the crypto. So, you know, get somebody else's implementation, it's a quality implementation, and subscribe for the patches for the whole system and apply them. No patches, you've got vulnerabilities, we'll get you. And then the final reminder regarding you know, Matt Honan and the uh, security questions that didn't work. Nothing is stronger than the weakest link. Um, Perfect encryption, well, fine, just beat him with a $5 wrench until he tells us the passphrase. Oh, that's what you meant with the, asking him about the, the, the rubber hose. Rubber hose, rubber hose rubber hose there encryption. Rubber hose encryption. He was trying to explain that to me. Rubber hose cryptanalysis. Ah. They're using a $5 dollar wrench here. Frankly, unless you shop at the MIT flea market, that wrench is going to cost more than $5. <laughs> but it wasn't the MIT flea market for $5. Okay. That is our prepared program, so it's now time for key exchange. Okay, now everybody Thank you, Bill.